Good morning, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. Though we still cannot gather together, thankfully we have these virtual opportunities to worship and hear God's Word together. Last week, Randy explored the new normal we may be facing, and what he referred to as a something longer than a blizzard and more like an ice age. That is, a season where life may not return to normal anytime soon. It's a sobering thought, which it would be wise to soberly face. For many of us, this feels like a rude awakening. But could it be the beginning of something else? Could a rude awakening be the beginning of a great awakening? Thus the title of Fred's upcoming message, Rude Awakening or Great Awakening. But first, let's give our time to the Lord in prayer as we begin a time of worship together. May the words and music of Psalm 23 bring us into God's presence as we welcome His presence. Lord, You are our shelter in every storm, our comforter and peace when fear rises all around us. So we raise our voices in praise, for praise silences the enemy and calms every storm. Oh, how about the band? Aren't they amazing? Mr. Pavel Zanetsky. and shepherd over your people Israel all these centuries.
shepherd I shall not want only he restored my soul Hallelujah Just 
Father, thank you for this time of worship. Lord, thank you for your very real presence. May the weight of your glory, Lord, stay with us as we open our hearts to your word. We pray in Jesus, Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, thank you, Ted Pierce and Paul Wilbur, for bringing us into God's presence. Well, good morning, everyone, if you're watching in the morning. Well, it was only a few weeks ago, though it seems much longer, that we celebrated Good Friday. And thank you again, Dave Fritz. Well, we call it good, but uh, let's be real. That first Good Friday seemed anything but good. It was a rude awakening. Why is that? Because the disciples, they didn't expect Jesus to die. They weren't expecting a cross. They were expecting a crown. And what they thought would end in triumph, we know, ended in tragedy. And when Jesus warned them that his destiny was a cross, they were not only confused, they were in denial. They just weren't willing to face it. They had false expectations, and as a result, they spent the next three days living in fear. Well, fast forward to today. We, too, can live with false expectations that this pandemic, this season, this ice age will quickly go away and life will return to normal. Kind of like this guy. We hope the end is near. Not the end of the world, but the end of the pandemic. And yes, we are optimists. But if life doesn't return to normal, if COVID-19 returns in the fall, like the disciples, we too may be tempted to live in fear. So let's face it, it feels like Friday, and it doesn't feel good. But here's the truth. We can face Friday because we can see Sunday. We know Sunday's coming. The Friday didn't feel good. It actually was good because it wasn't the end. Likewise, this pandemic is not the end of the world, as some predict. And though it is not the end of the world, it is most likely is the end of of an error, even as 9-11 was for us an end of an error. Now think about it. The economy, professional sports, health care, Hollywood, jobs, school, travel, child care, shopping, youth athletics, campaigning, restaurants, the military, entertainment, elections, colleges, cruises, funerals, all have been impacted dramatically and perhaps permanently. You know, someone once said, there's no going back. To Kansas. So here's my question. Could this bad news actually be good news? Is it possible that though it feels like Friday, Sunday is coming when new life, resurrection life will spring forth? And if so, what will it look like? Well, no one, you know, really knows for sure, but most likely it will look different. Things may no longer look the same or even be the same, but that could be a good thing. For even Jesus, think about this, even Jesus, after his resurrection, looked different, and he too was no longer the same. In other words, a rude awakening could become a great awakening. In fact, for there to be a great awakening, there must be, first, a rude awakening. So here's a question. Could it be that this natural pandemic is a wake-up call to another pandemic, what I would call a moral pandemic, which begs the question, why has America lost so much ground morally and spiritually over the last 30 years, and especially the last 10 years? You know, it feels like the proverbial pedal has been pressed to the metal. Now think about it. America, once defined by Christian values, now those very values are vilified. You know, long-honored traditions, values, and morals are now considered immoral. You know, it wasn't that long ago that cohabitation was considered immoral. Now, it's normal, and what is really most disconcerting is that even for many Christians, it's now the new norm. You know, it wasn't that long ago that sexual purity was a virtue. Now, virginity is viewed as an anomaly and even an abnormality. Instead of teachers teaching our children Bible stories, we now have drag queens reading stories to our children in libraries. No longer in our schools can we call our children girls and boys, but teachers now teach them how to use, 
you got it, sex toys. And one of our highest values, freedom of speech, has now become hate speech, if it reflects biblical values and morals. And those who are willing to take a stand will most likely be branded a bigot, a racist, a fascist, or a misogynist, which is all part, many believe, of a well-designed plan. Even freedom of religion is now under attack, as many are calling for freedom from religion. Listen to this petition from Change.org. Quote, keeping the phrase under God in the Pledge of Allegiance is a clear violation to the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. We have to separate personal beliefs from government. It is unconstitutional. We need freedom from religion. Sadly, we are becoming what Isaiah prophesied, a nation that caused good evil and evil good, light darkness and darkness light, sweet, bitter, and bitter sweet. But why has all this happened? What has caused this moral pandemic? You know, should we blame atheists, leftists, or communists? Should we blame our politicians for our growing secularism? Well, rather than give my opinion, let me quote some of the fathers of our faith. Their answer may just be a rude awakening. I think we all know about Charles Finney. He was a leader in the Second Great Awakening in the 1830s. He said this, If Satan rules in our halls of legislature, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. End quote. In other words, the church, he's saying, is responsible for it. Now that's a strong indictment. And like me, you might be asking, you know, is it fair to hold the church accountable for America's moral decline? Well, let me again quote some of our spiritual fathers. William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army. And speaking, I believe, prophetically, he said, quote, I consider that the chief dangers which confront the coming century will be religion without the Holy Spirit, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. Church theologian and historian David Wells commented on the contemporary state of the church, quote, As a result, he said, the church has produced a generation of Christians for whom theology is irrelevant and whose lives outside the church do not differ practically from those of atheists. Mario Murillo, who was a preacher, evangelist, and early pioneer in the Jesus Charismatic Movement, recently said it this way, quote, we are very good at what we do, meaning the church, but what good is that if it's not what we are supposed to be doing? Worst of all, we are doing it as America sinks. That makes us the best party on the deck of the Titanic. Ouch. Well, Jesus was perhaps even more direct with his warning when he said, You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Definitely not one of Jesus' most popular sayings, but it does feel like we are being kind of trampled, doesn't it? So, in the words of the late Francis Schaeffer, what can we then do? Well, if you're anything like me, you probably feel like not much. You know, what difference can I make? What can I do that will make any difference? Well, if you feel that way, I have three words that can help you. First word, it's repentance. Acts 3.19, Peter, standing before a crowd of thousands, said, And now you must repent. Why? So that times of refreshing, that is to say, times of revival, will stream from the presence of the Lord which is to say, making a difference starts with repentance. Now say that with me. Making a difference starts with repentance. Good job. You know, if you feel like your life makes little difference, you're not alone. 
most of those we consider heroes of the faith felt exactly the same. Listen to Moses when God called him. He said, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? I'm not eloquent. I am slow of speech and of tongue. O oh Lord, I pray, send someone else. Or Gideon, when God called him, he said, My clan is the weakest, and I am the feeblest in my family. Or Jeremiah, when God called him, quote, I don't know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. You know, I can, I can relate to that. I too freaked when God first called me to speak. Well, how about Peter, when Jesus called him? Peter said, Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. And he too felt unworthy to be Jesus' disciple. So is there anyone among us who hasn't felt the same? Who hasn't felt like the weakest or the feeblest in our family? Or if not our family, our church? Or if not the church, then at work? Who hasn't freaked when asked to speak because you feel slow of speech? Who hasn't felt lowly even though God calls you lovely? So what did repentance mean for Moses, for Gideon, for Jim, Jeremiah, for Peter? Well, I believe it meant this. It meant turning away from unbelief to belief, believing that their lives could make a difference. And here's the deal. What was true for them is true for us. If we repent and turn from unbelief to belief, if we stop looking at ourselves at our weakness and leastness, I think that's a word, our lives too can still make a difference. Case in point, and my brother I don't think would mind me sharing. In fact, I know he wouldn't. It was almost three years ago that he tried to take his life, and he almost succeeded. He had recently turned 80, and he felt that his life was no longer worth living, that his life was no longer making a difference that his best years were behind him, and his, his life, for all intents and purposes, was over. But God intervened. Thank God. And now at 83, he no longer believes his best years are behind him. He believes once again that his life makes a difference. And you know how it all started? It all started with that word, repentance. So, first word, Repentance. Second word, resistance. James 4, verse 7. Resist the devil and he will flee. Webster, properly known as Noah Webster, you know, the guy who learns 26 languages to write his dictionary, he defined resistance as the refusal to accept or comply with something, the attempt to prevent something by action or argument. Recently, last March, a new film was released. I don't know if you saw it. It's called Resistance. It's a biographical film based on the life of Marcel Marceau, who you may remember was a famous mime artist. But what most people, however, don't know is that in his youth, at the age of 16, he was recruited by the French Resistance and as a result, rescued the lives of hundreds of children from Nazi concentration camps. Wow. I mean, who would have known it if not for this movie? But here's the deal, another deal. You too, you have been recruited into a resistance movement to join with Jesus to destroy the works of the devil and to rescue the lost and the least, whether you're 16, 66, or 86, and maybe 10 years from now, I'll probably add 96. God tells us that each of us have been recruited and equipped to do what? to do battle against the principalities, the powers, the rulers of this present darkness. God tells us that each of us have been given weapons that are, quote, mighty through God for the tearing down of strongholds and every vain imagination, if I may add, every ism, every ideology that opposes the knowledge of God, 2 Corinthians 10.3. And if we stand, quote, firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, Philippians 1.27, we too can resist the devil and command him to flee from our families, our communities, and yes, even our country. Resistance can make a difference. And the third word, revelation. Paul prays 
that God would enlighten the eyes of our minds, that we may receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Ephesians 1.17 For without eyes to see, I believe, we can miss the moment we are in, the threshold of a great awakening. You know, it could be easy to despair for our future. It's staggering to see what has happened to the youth of America who are our hope for the future. You know, church, they say, not interested. Christians, bah, they're all hypocritical. Biblical morals, eh, passe. Theism, no thanks. We prefer atheism. They call, I'm not sure you've heard of him, but he's a youth evangelist that's really making a difference. He summed it up when he said this. We're looking at the most Bible illiterate and unchurched generation in history, a generation that is walking away from the church. But, now listen, this is precisely why we need revelation. Follow me. Though it looks like Friday, Sunday could be closer than we think. Why? Because this may be the very thing that will catalyze and crystallize an awakening in America. Think about it. When university professors demean traditional spirituality and morality, specifically Christianity, they think they're producing atheists. But instead, it just may do the opposite. Why? Because in their attempt to suppress the truth, they are actually intensifying the search for truth. In their attempt to rule out any absolute, they only create a hunger for an absolute, which may explain why so many revivals throughout history began on college campuses. Case in point, the last major revival, the charismatic revival that swept up thousands, including me. In the fall of 1969, I was a freshman at U of M, College Park. You know, I was a typical product of my generation, free love, psychedelic drugs, Eastern religions, occultism, and a naive and stupid attraction to communism. And together with thousands of my comrades, we mocked the National Guard as we blocked all the boulevards, especially Route 1 to the Pentagon, with the goal of starting a revolution. You know, they were just really, they were wild and crazy days. But it was all, out of all of that that another revolution erupted, a spiritual revolu revolution, a Jesus revolution that came out of the blue, unexpectedly bringing tens of thousands of youth into the kingdom. And here's the thing. It happened then, and it can happen again. Around the same time, a young pastor's father asked a traveling evangelist to preach for his son who wasn't doing real well. One night after the service, the evangelist and the father sat and talked when the father began to weep a desperate cry to see God move. The evangelist said that it was the most desperate cry he had ever seen. He knew the father was on the verge of a breakthrough. He knew his heart's cry was cleansing him for something great to come. The dad was Earl Johnson. His son was, you guessed it, Bill Johnson. It happened then, and it can happen again. A blog I recently read commenting on the need to quarantine said, you may have to stay at home, but you don't have to stay the same. You can still change. And I believe that's true. Whether we're 16, 66, 86, we can change. We can repent and turn from unbelief to belief. We can resist the devil and command him to flee. And we can receive revelation that what happened then can happen again. And here's the deal. This is my final deal. God can not only change you, he can use you. Even during this ice age, and even if you are in your old age or still in your teenage, God wants to use you to usher in this new age of revival and spiritual renewal. Why? Because 2020 is not just another year but very well be, may be a prophetic year, the year to get new purpose and new vision, which you might call a 2020 vision. So, my encouragement to you and to myself, too, don't count yourself out. What you think of yourself does not matter. What he can do to and through you makes your age, your education, or talent irrelevant. 
As someone once said, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called, and you have been called. So to wrap things up, I have one more question for your reflection, a question asked by Rabbi Moshe Friedman. Here's his question. What are we called to do when the world goes viral and we seem to be descending into a downward spiral? Well, watch with me for the answer. As we descend further into this downward spiral, we ask ourselves what happens when the world goes viral. Panic is prevalent. Collapse seems evident. Our heads swirl with a bevy of negative messages. From global financial deficit to the latest handshake etiquette, all the while worrying about the health of our relatives. But with no present hope for a vaccine, all we can do is obsess over keeping our hands clean and wondering when exactly we should self-quarantine. That 21st century sense of security was an illusion. Now the only thing worse than the fear is the confusion. Everyone's looking for a prophecy or a sign. Well, your guess is as good as mine, but I'd rather use this time of sobriety to reflect on what this says about our society. It might seem obvious, but we all share these feelings. We are not gods, we are mere human beings. And our vulnerability gets to the heart of it. We cannot conquer nature because we are a part of it. And now we are being forced to hide, to leave work or school and stay inside. And all this alone time might sound sickening, but well before this virus, we had gotten used to social distancing. We can't wait for that Netflix family drama to resume while ignoring our real family dinner in the next room. No interaction on trains except for rare nods, head down, separated by a phone and AirPods. Even visits from friends we no longer expect, now replaced by a call or more often, just a text. So perhaps after all this isolation we'll discover a new appreciation for spending time with one another. But by far the most important lesson in these hours is that no amount of wealth or powers, nor ivory towers, can protect me from a fate that is not mine, but ours. How far have we gotten? How close are we to the bottom that we needed a deadly disease to show us what we all have in common? Because we may no longer shake hands. We may hide with masks held by flimsy rubber bands. We may cancel flights from other lands. But finally, as one humanity, we stand. So I beg you, do not forget the unity we now feel against a common threat. It just may spark the change worldwide that could one day have us looking back with pride and say this was the moment we bridged the divide. But that future is up to you and me to decide. Well, I agree. The future is up to you and me to decide. We need repentance, resistance, revelation but we also need to make a decision. And it's a decision that starts with prayer. So I invite you to pray this prayer with me. God, I ask this morning that you would open my eyes to see as you see. It looks like Friday, but give me eyes for Sunday. Holy Spirit, help me to see the part I can play. Help me to believe the difference I can make. Help me to do what you're calling me to do. And may this rude awakening become a great awakening, I pray in Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, I pray the words of my mouth this morning and the meditation of my heart were pleasing to God and a blessing to you. And may the Lord bless you as you receive this ancient blessing. Yevarechecha Adonai 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and show you how good he is and give you his peace, his shalom. Hashem Yeshua, in Jesus' name, amen and amen.